All right, we ready to go? No, we missing anybody? No, we're Excellent. <clears throat> well, I'm very excited. This is the last of our neurochemistry series. Who is that? Mary. Mary. Okay, good. What are we doing? They're calling me. Hello. I will keep eating. And I have I have a hard stop. Yeah, because I have a webinar at one o'clock. Trish and I are doing a national webinar. I'm telling the world how to do thrombectomy certification. They liked us so well that they let us do it again. <clears throat> um, hold on. Okay, do guys. <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, I'm very excited because uh, this is the end of neurochemistry. Uh, next week we start neuropharmacology. It also ends a, a five-part series on second messengers, and um, this is many ways what we've been heading for uh, all along. That is, uh, we started, of course, with a concept of uh, G protein receptors. And then we went along to second messengers, including the cyclic nucleotides, and then the protein kinase C, diacylglycerol, uh, tri-inositol uh, phosphate uh, uh, families. But, excuse me, last week we talked about calcium. And uh, today is the point of all of that second messengering and extracellular messengering. And that is how all of this uh, gets executed, which is by protein phosphorylation. So this is a um, this is also, a, in some ways, an enormous lecture. Is why I wanted to start early. Uh, at uh, it, last year, I gave this as two. Uh, last time, last series, we gave this as two separate lectures. It had 128 slides, and uh, we're down to less than 60 slides. This has been quite an exercise in the last week here. As always, we will begin by uh, looking at the real hard inorganic chemistry of this uh, uh, structure. So let's look at phosphorus here. Phosphorus is in the middle of the periodic chart. It's uh, everything we've been looking at before has been either a, a metal or um, an allied. And uh, here we're right in the middle. So we have 15 uh, electrons floating around. There are five in the uh, outer orbital, which makes it unique in that you can it can share uh, pairs, uh, one pair of electrons and then split up the other three electrons to share them with oxygen, creating, however, a minus three ion, which is incredible. Uh, we Last week we talked about charge density with uh, <clears throat> divalent cations. Um, this one has three, this is a three minus uh, ion. So that's an incredible uh, amount of um, uh, energy stored in this structure. And you can see that you can take one of these uh, oxygens, um, typically this one of the oxygens and uh, create an ester. And we're going to be dealing with esters um, for the rest of the time. Once you think about that uh, like this and you look at that, all of the energy that's uh, pent up into the phosphate ion, you then look at the ATP and you begin to realize why ATP has so much energy. Look at this concentration of charge here when you have three phosphates linked uh, in uh, ester linkages. So that's incredible. And uh, th I like this diagram because it points to the fact that the water uh, in the region of this thing is absolutely chaotic. Um, uh, it's moving around at high speed because of all this concentration of uh, negative charge. Uh, and uh, then uh, these are just a couple of other diagrams to give you a sense of the organization of water around the phosphate group. Um, like I said, in this region around it, it's just moving chaotically and then it gets more organized into bulk water beyond that. 
The other thing is when you look at it uh, again from a straight chemistry point of view is in order to break one of these bonds and remake the bond, okay, not waste the energy just by cleaving it, but to use it for something useful, you're going to have to, with all this negative charge, you're going to have to bring in a cation and magnesium is the cation that is, it is required for virtually all reactions having to do with ATP. Uh, and um, calcium is too big. <clears throat> if you remember from the chart, uh, the, the pictures that we showed last week, the, the two positive uh, um, charge uh, of the calcium is spread out uh, much more uh, widely than, than it is in magnesium. It was highly concentrated, much smaller uh, nucleus. <clears throat> And then uh, the main phosphorylation mechanism that we're going to be looking at is the transfer of a phosphate from ATP onto a, a, an amino acid hydroxyl group. And those are going to be serine, threonine, and tyrosine are going to be the three. We're going to look at them. Here is serine uh, and uh, transferring the phosphate onto the uh, oxygen, the hydroxyl group of serine. And that would just be a typical reaction. Now, protein phosphorylation uh, is the most abundant form of cell regulation. This goes, uh, we, we have constantly focused on phylogeny, right? This is at the beginning, okay? Single cell organisms uh, depend on phosphorylation and dephosphorylation uh, for regulation of their metabolism. And so does basically every other cell, eukaryotic cell that exists. Uh, and most, quite frankly, most of the uh, prokaryotes as well. The um, action of transferring the phosphate and taking it off for regulation has, has been present from the beginning of life, basically. And virtually every, virtually every extracellular signal and every external stimulus that we're going to encounter with the nervous system depends on, uh, exerts its influence by the phosphorylation state of specific proteins. Every extracellular signal Okay, every physical stimulus, whether it's light or sound or whatever it is, it's mediated through phosphorylation of proteins. <clears throat> this is the most common molecular switch in, in, in life, throughout life. You can just, you, and, you, and it's basically, you have a kinase and you have a phosphatase. The kinase puts the phosphate on a particular um, hydroxyl residue and the phosphatase takes it off. And that can either turn the system on or turn the system off, depending on the specific system. So you've got tons and tons of specificity, and we're just, that's what we're going to be looking at. It is the primary means of post-translational modification of protein. You hear about methylation, you hear about acetylation, all those occur. They are nothing compared to phosphorylation. Phosphorylation overwhelms everything else and virtually is always on a serine, threonine, or tyrosine. The phosphorylation state is a balance between the kinase and phosphatase activities. And both of the kinases and the phosphatases are heavily regulated at multiple levels, which we're going to be looking at. This is, we're still, this is all just still introduction. <laughs> here's the serine, here's the threonine. So threonine, I wish they had turned this so the methyl group was in the horizontal plane and the oxygen was sticking up so that you would more clearly see the uh, similarity uh, but, but in all cases, serine, threonine, and tyrosine, all of them, the phosphorylation is occurring on a terminal distal hydroxyl group, okay? And all of them, of course, consume ATP. <clears throat> all of them require magnesium as their cofactor, okay? You just can't get these guys to get close enough to one another with all this negative charge floating around. You've got to mitigate that charge and get them to have a vehicle for them to move electrons from one place to another. And that requires this highly concentrated magnesium and very small magnesium divalent. I think is the last introductory slide then, uh, you can see the sort of thing that goes on as you phosphorylate. The idea is that through phosphorylation, you change the conformation of a protein, which will make it either active or inactive. And here, so here you go. Here's an inactive protein, just a typical diagram of, uh, notice that the, these are internal electrostatic interactions with the protein, the positive line up with the negatives, and that closes the enzymatic cleft. But when you start phosphorylating it, okay, so you bind, you, bind, you, you initiate a process with some trigger, 
And then as soon as you do that, you start phosphorylating these positive charges, creating negative charges. Now you have negative charges and negative charges and you open the cleft, all right? But, all right, and that exposes the catalytic site, which is now active. But all you need to do to shut that site off is phosphorylate the, right, the catalytic site. And that's the end. The enzyme now becomes inactive. You want to recycle the enzyme? Put a phosphatase in there that can take all those phosphates we put, and you return it to its quiescent state. Okay? That's what's going to be going on continuously um, at, uh, at a highly specific uh, set of levels. Look at this. The kinases and phosphatases make up 2% of all proteins. That's an enormous number when you figure that you need structural proteins, right? You have intermediary metabolism need. You have all the, these kinases are your regulatory system. And they're so prevalent and so specific that you can actually generate what's called a kinome, whereby you can follow the evolution of cell types and, and organisms throughout um, phylogeny based on uh, the, the, which uh, specific kinases and phosphatases are present, okay? So then let's look at a kinase as a general issue, and we'll get to some specific examples. These are just general comments now about protein kinases. <clears throat> energy, right? How many times have we talked about energy? So you don't want to be doing this more than you need if you do it. Phosphate, you're spending an ATP, you're consuming energy. You don't want to do that unless you need to. So most kinases are inactive in the basal state. You don't want them phosphorylating everything and activating everything. Phosphatases generally are active because they're just cleaving off the phosphate group. So they don't consume a lot of energy. So kinases, okay, therefore, inactive kinase in the resting state, inactive kinases, active phosphatases, the balance is low phosphorylation state of the cell in its resting state. Okay. There are, look at this, 518 known protein kinases. These are unique enzymes, okay? 518 different protein kinases, 428 of them phosphorylate a serine or a threonine, 90 phosphorylate tyrosine. So the bulk is on serine and threonine, and tyrosine makes up a much smaller group. In addition, if you look at it another way, 85%, more than 85% of all protein phosphorylation occurs on a serine residue. 12% on the threonine residue, which is very similar, and only 2% occurs on tyrosine. But this is an incredibly powerful and important 2%. Do not let that small bulk uh, mislead you. You will see why this is incredibly important uh, um, to the cell. You have two major mechanisms for regulating your kinases. Number one, um, you have a direct activate a direct kinase, all right? So the extracellular messenger comes to the surface of the plasma membrane, right? And it directly activates a plasma membrane receptor, which has the cytoplasmic catalytic subunit, all right? That actively um, triggers the cascade. So you bind the receptor to the, um, to the receptor kinase, all right? And that is active, that's, the, that's it. That does the trigger. The, that, that protein then phosphorylates what is nearly always a tyrosine. So the mechanism is external um, ligand, re plasma membrane receptor, phosphorylation of tyrosine. That's it. You got it. It's done. The, that's only 2% of the time. The bulk of the time is the indirect mechanism whereby an extra cell, this is for the last four weeks is what we've been talking about. An extracellular messenger comes along. It activates either a G protein coupled receptor, or I want, I meant to modify this slide, or an ion channel, right? Or an ion channel, which then regulates the intracellular concentration of some second messenger, which in turn regulates the kinase. So this is indirect. This is ligand binding to the, to the receptor, okay? Alters a second messenger, such as cyclic AMP, GMP, calcium, diisoglycerol, triphosphoinositol. Familiar, right? This is, again, this is what we've been doing for the last four weeks. And that, that results in a phosphorylation uh, by the kinase, and that's nearly always going to be serine or threonine. So two very distinct mechanisms, okay? 
And this diagram just shows you those two distinct mechanisms, direct to a, a, a protein, so direct receptor to a tyrosine kinase or indirect mechanism via well, everything that we know um, to the um, serine or threonine. <clears throat> The indirect mechanism does all of these things that, I mean, here's your nervous system, basically, okay? All of them are gonna be regulated by this indirect mechanism, okay? Everything in the, um, and here's, here's anticipating where I'm going with this. In the adult nervous system, okay? All of this is being done here by the serine threonine system. So in an established system, you use the second messenger mechanisms. We'll come back to that statement in a little bit. Each kinase, each kinase now, now we're saying there are 400 and what if we say 518 kinases, right? All together, each one has a specific physiologic role. You have to regulate them. And the regulation is not only achieved by various uh, um, uh, direct mechanisms, but we emphasized a long time ago, the value of the cytoskeletal system and, and the construction of rafts for protein assemblages whereby you can create local domains where the kinases can be active and regulated by in a spatial temporal manner. And in addition to the kinases being phosphorylated, controlling their transcription, controlling their translation, okay? Um, and, uh, and each of them has different substrate specificities. The brain, um, and this is a general principle about the brain, probably all 518, each, each organ, might, if there are 518 kinases, most organs will express somewhere between 10 and 100. Okay, a liver, very complex organ, might express 100 of the kinases. The brain uses all 518. Okay, the brain is so complex and so uh, differentiated and so many unique functions all packed in together that it just makes use of everything. Everything that's available through phylogeny gets used by the brain. You're, as you probably know, they say you could say the same thing about the genome. Um, the, if the brain uses virtually the entire actively transcribed genome. Okay, any parts that are, are gonna be transcribed from the brain. In terms of kinase substrate specificities, <clears throat> basically, remember, this goes back to the beginning of life. The catalytic subunit, is the same as in the beginning of life. You don't change that. Once you have this mechanism for transferring a phosphate to a hydroxyl group on a protein using magnesium as your cofactor, that's it, okay? It works and you're gonna undo it with the phosphatase. That doesn't change. What changes is the regulation of the catalytic domain, okay? And that's where all of the diversity comes. And some kinases will have a very broad range of substrates. And we're going to look at calcium calmodulin kinase as a good example of that. Whereas other proteins may have a single protein, which it phosphorylates. And myosin light chain kinase is a good example of that. There's no other protein that is phosphorylated by this particular kinase. Um, based on the substrate specificity, you can make families of kinases. That says, you'll see this term AGC. And you go, what the heck is that? Well, it's cyclic A, cyclic G, and phospholipase C. So those are your second messenger groups. So the, you make families of kinases according to the second messenger, which activates them. Okay? <clears throat> um, in addition to the, so here, intracellular localization. In addition, you have standard feedback on uh, enzymes, molecular interactions. The kinases, and you'll remember maybe the uh, protein kinase C. Remember protein kinase C had a funny mechanism for, for hiding the catalytic subunit. Remember I called it a toilet seat, right? So you have this toilet seat that closes. And when you even when you unhinge the toilet seat, there was a pseudo substrate that was on the protein that sat in the catalytic domain. And in order to activate the enzyme, you had to bind it to a cyclic GMP dependent mechanism that removed the, the pseudo substrate and exposed the catalytic site with the toilet seat open. Okay, that's the kind of thing that, uh, that goes on. These meaning that these kinases usually have their own inhibitory um, so, uh, mechanism. So they are auto inhibitory. Kinases are inactive in the basal state. Okay, you don't want them running around phosphorylating things and turning whole systems on unless you mean it. 
okay? Meaning some extracellular event has occurred which requires activation of a set of a pathway which is activated by the kinase, okay? <coughs> Different mechanisms, protein kinase A, you may remember, had the inhibitory subunits. Remember, we had the, uh, um, the um, there was the alpha inhibitory subunits that were uh, floating off the G protein receptors. You can use small molecules. And again, I keep saying localization. And here's a picture just to show you localization. We'll return to this picture later for specifics. But I keep wanting to get across this notion of a protein aggregate, what we call a raft. And the raft, look at the next picture. The raft, once assembled, can generate a local pool of cyclic AMP. It's not like the cyclic AMP is everywhere in, in the cell. And in fact, it's restricted, if you also remember, it's restricted this pool of cyclic AMP can't go anywhere because that region is surrounded by phosphodiesterases. So as soon as the cyclic AMP hits the phosphodiesterase cloud, okay, it's degraded. And so the signal can be kept quite localized. So it doesn't matter if there are other proteins over here, which might be activated by, so a protein kinase A might be over here. That doesn't do it any good. The cyclic A won't reach it. And so you have, again, this, this idea which goes all the way back to our cytoskeletal discussions. And I keep using the dendritic spine as an ideal example that you, it has a local metabolism of second messengers of its own, which allows the dendritic spine, even though it's, it's fractions of a micron away from another whole different protein membrane complex, it keeps them independent of one another because the second messenger can't get from one complex to another. You have these local growth of cell. It just what is what makes the cell so absolute, the neuron so just fascinating and capable of so much regulation, right? Those are the kinases that puts the phosphate on. Let's look at the phosphatases in general, still in general. The phosphatases antagonize the kinases by hydrolyzing the phosphoester bonds that are made. You have three families of phosphatases. You have a serine threonine family, you have a tyrosine family, and you have a dual family, and they break up into different groups. And we're only going to consider the phosphoprotein um, uh, phosphatases, uh, this group in here. Um, there are only, remember, there were 428 different serine threonine kinases. Okay, only one tenth that number of phosphatases. So the specificity is occurring through the kinase. Okay, the phosphatases are receiving a signal and say, okay, erase the board. That's really the best example I can think of. You, I wrote all this stuff down. I wrote so much specific, and I have diagrams, I have tables. It's like, take the eraser and clean the board, okay, and start over again. So you don't need specificity in your phosphatases. My eraser, I might have used six different colors on the board. It doesn't matter. I just take one eraser and they're all gone. That's what the phosphatases are like. You just, you don't have the proliferation for the serine threonine phosphatases. Let's be real clear here. This is for the serine threonine phosphatases. It's gonna be different when we get to tyrosine. Tyrosine is different, okay? <clears throat> and this diagram just sort of makes the point. Yeah, kinase, phosphatase, kinase, phosphatase, put it on, take it off, put it on, take it off. Just like the kinases, the phosphatases have a single common catalytic use subunit that goes from the single cell organisms to our brain, all right, and everything in between. And you just take that catalytic subunit and you regulate it, that's all. You stick something else on that controls the activity, okay? Um, they are like, just like the kinases, they're heavily expressed in the brain. They are tightly regulated, but tightly regulated by second messengers, okay? and Here's a, a funny principle that if you want to amplify a neuronal network, inhibit the phosphatase. Let the kinase do its work and don't erase the board. Okay? Leave it. And that keeps the system on. And that's going to provide us a mechanism of memory and learning. Okay? Both long, short term and long term. All right? So activate it with a kinase but inhibit your phosphatase and the signal is powerfully amplified, okay? Think of the oscillators. So calcium in, calcium out, calcium in, calcium out. Phosphate on, phosphate off, phosphate on, 
more phosphate on, more phosphate on, okay? And build up a system, okay? Uh, all your protein's getting phosphorylated and you like what you're doing, make more, make more protein, phosphorylate that too, and amplify your system. So it's also going to have to be able to signal the, the nucleus that it wants the DNA, this DNA transcribed, which means it's going to have to, you're going to have to be able to use this kinase system also to um, open up the histones and expose the DNA for transcription and then let the DNA be translated into RNA. And this diagram just, it's, it's just on, off, on, off, kinases on, phosphatase is on. Let's take an example, a very powerful example for the nervous system. So calmodulin, which we've encountered before, all right, is calcium modulating protein. Its purpose, as you may remember all the way back to the synapse, its purpose is to take proteins which are not sensitive to calcium intrinsically and impart a sensitivity to calcium by binding to it. Now let's think about the economy of doing this right now. Let's say that I want to activate my cell in response to calcium entering the cell. Common mechanism, right? We saw that last week. Everything that we do brings calcium into the cell to activate it. This, do you really want to have to put a calcium regulatory subunit on every protein in the neuron? You know, on, on thousands upon thousands of neurons, that they're all going to have to build a calcium sensing mechanism such that when the calcium is it activates, you don't want to do this over and over again. So instead, you create a system which is very flexible and capable of interacting with a wide array of proteins and let it become the calcium sensing mechanism. And then upon binding the calcium to the calmodulin, let the calmodulin interact with all those thousands of different proteins and change your configuration. And so that's the way the system works, okay? You have, you remember that we talked about calmodulin is a very flexible molecule, literally, literally flexible, with four uh, EF hand domains, I'll show you that again. And, and, and the calmodulin also can be modified by phosphorylation as well as by methylation and acetylation or taking them off. And the calmodulin regulates a large number of functions in the cell. Here's your EF hand. Remember, that was a calcium binding site. Calmodulin contains four calcium binding sites, two on each head, and then this unbelievably flexible chain uh, in between. So then it literally just wraps itself around the enzymes and changes their configuration. And so you control a huge array of proteins. You give them back calcium sensing mechanism by letting the calmodulin sense the calcium and then let the calmodulin interact with what, not just a kinase, but any enzyme that you want, but including kinases and phosphatases. You impart calcium sensitivity by calcium calmodulin. Then you have a specific calcium calmodulin kinase, okay, which phosphorylates a whole array of proteins, which we said it had a very broad substrate uh, uh, specificity. Look at this. Up to 20% of postsynaptic protein is calcium calmodulin kinase 2. 20% of the protein in the postsynaptic terminal is the single kinase. Okay, so when you use your receptor, when you, when you release the ligand out of the synaptic vesicle, it comes across the cleft, it interacts with, with the receptor, okay? Boom, the whole system is being amplified by the influx of calcium, the binding of the calcium by the calmodulin, the binding of the cal calcium calmodulin to the kinase, and everybody gets phosphorylated. 20% of the protein sitting there is to phosphorylate everybody else. That's an amazing amplification, okay? So you just have an explosion of calcium influence in the postsynaptic terminal mediated by this kinase, okay? It, it, it is auto-inhibited, you relieve the inhibition, and then now here's something that happens that's really interesting. And now we're sort of, this is the kind of thing that will occur, an immediate activation and maybe short-term memory, we'll come back to this. But look at this. If it's persistently, if the kinase okay, is persistently activated, it is capable of rendering itself autonomous of calcium. 
Calcium tomodulin kinase, when consistently activated, can render itself autonomously active. It's going to stay active. It's constitutively active. That's going to strengthen, right? That's going to strengthen that synapse permanently. Okay, that's learning. That is that is learning. That's what learning is. Okay, a synapse is strengthened, permanently strengthened, no longer as dependent upon activation by calcium as it once was. It's now constituently active. Okay, just a you know the kind of diagrams, and I just put these diagrams up to show you the how what a spaghetti factory you can make of cross regulation of everybody regulating and cross regulating itself with calcium uh, comodulin, calcium comodulin kinase, calcineurin, which you say, well, what's calcineurin? Calcineurin is the phosphatase for this system. Okay, so there you go. So protein phosphatase 2B is calcineurin. And its job is to reverse the phosphorylation done by the calcium comodulin kinase. All right? So that's the pair. Okay, this was just a specific example. And by regulating the calcineurin, inhibit that calcineurin, okay? And all of that 20% of the kinase, which was active and phosphorylated all these postsynaptic enzymes, okay? Those are now active and going to stay active. And so in particular, if you go back to our thinking about the NMDA channel, which is active under high depolarization, intense depolarization, very high levels of sustained levels of calcium. Turn the system on, make it begin to change the, the, uh, the nuclear structure, activate it through DNA, okay? In addition to all of these phosphorylations, inhibit the calcineurin. Just stop the calcineurin. And the NMDA channels effects are going to have be sustained, okay? That the calcium may long be gone out of the cell. Okay, the NMDA channel was activated by a high sustained level. The calcium may go away, but the effect is going to persist because it activated a set of kinases and inhibited the phosphatase. So the phosphorylation, that high phosphorylation state persists. And <clears throat> this is, I just put, the, this is literally from a paper on modeling schizophrenia. And you can look at these things a different way. What is the cell type? Blah, 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 blah. What's the life experience of the person, their genetics? Okay. But another level of looking at this has to do with this. So if you may have a uh, poorly functioning calcineurin, um, the person may have the positive phenomena of schizophrenia. It's just a theory. But this is the level at which people are thinking about uh, the role of protein phosphorylation in the nervous system. Yep. Right. That's right. Yep. And yep. All right. Getting more specific looking now at the nervous system specifically. Um, I mean, this is almost a platitude at this point. The most basic, most, most brain proteins are phosphorylated. Most of the time, if they do anything that you care about that we're going to study throughout your life, the proteins are phosphorylated. And like any other um, uh, modification of the protein, then they result in a change in activity. They can change subcellular localization. They can cause them to be associated with different proteins. Um, all of this is true. Uh, again, I'm just these are just examples of what you do with um, neuronal phosphorylation. You can change the substrate affinity. You can change protein-protein interaction. We talked about opening histones and leading to transcription, bringing them to the plasma membrane, making them go away from the plasma membrane, putting them in subcellular organelles, whatever you want to do. Look at this, tyrosine hydroxylase. I think this is your first pharmacology lecture is on uh, dopamine, um, catecholamines, synthesized by tyrosine hydroxylase. The enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase is phosphorylated by nine different kinases. <laughs> Think about the regulation now that, that's involved here. Nine different kinase systems to regulate the single enzyme, okay? This is the level of complexity that we're talking about and the degree of specificity that the central nervous system is capable. 
Um, this, I've been mentioning this all along. Short-term memory is a state of uh, elevated pro protein phosphorylation, uh, either in the pre or post or both uh, synaptic uh, proteins. And, and just the phosphorylation state alone may give you about 15 minutes of memory. Um, after a while, you then set these other things in motion, including translation and transcription, and you end up with long-acting, uh, long-lasting changes with, the, uh, like we talked about, the creation of autonomous kinases and the inhibition of the phosphatases. That's going to lead to long-term, long-term potentiation, long-term memories, all of that. That cell is available throughout your life or group of cells. So you have a memory. How, how do you remember something from childhood? Why, why does that not degrade over time? Right? You have to have a mechanism for this permanent storage. If you stored it in the DNA, it wouldn't be accessible. You'd have to go get it. It would take you a day to go get that memory if you put it in the DNA, right? And, and you're not gonna have all that RNA floating around forever. So there's something else that's there. What's there is a permanent state of the synapse, which is permanently, it's, it's an indelible memory, okay? It's an indelible memory because something about it caught your attention. It was impressive. It created a state of mind that you can't eliminate. That synapse, that postsynaptic, that, that synapse now has autonomous kinases without phosphatases. That's permanent. And there it is, okay? And this is just a diagram of all that. And notice uh, it starts with the NMDA channel and, and activation of different, here are your um, non-receptor G proteins, your small G proteins, changing the nucleus. Here's someone asked, I think Annie asked the other day about mTOR, is mTOR involved or someone? I don't remember, but it doesn't matter. It's a, yes, mTOR pathway is here, okay? Move AMTA channels around and, 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 and move the whole thing around with your actin cytoskeleton, right? And you just, you make this a permanent memory, all right? Now, and this is where we're gonna start moving toward as we move away from the serine and threonine kinases and we start to think about tyrosine kinases. The idea here is that phosph protein phosphorylation not only regulates messengering, you know, communication, signaling, information transfer, if you will, but other cell-cell interactions are mediated by kinases, by protein phosphorylation, including things like cell adhesion, cytoskeletal dynamics, protein trafficking and transcription. We're gonna to have to develop the nervous system, okay? So I, I, I said serine and threonine, think of the adult nervous system, but we're gonna to have to make this nervous system. Okay, we'll come to that. Specific protein kinases, I'm not gonna go over this, you get it. Uh, the, you have cyclic A, cyclic G, protein C kinases, you know, protein kinase C. And so you have these different groups. Um, each of those was a separate lecture, all right? So we'll just move on. You have the same sort of thing with the protein phosphatases. The protein phosphatase has, this protein phosphatase one has a wide array of substrates. Protein phosphatase 2A was the one that we said was, um, uh, sorry, 2B was associated with calcium calmodulin. 2A is strictly related to serine and threonine. Um, and then you have this other group, which has some very bizarre um, um, uh, and, and absolutely unique um, uh, phosphorylation sites that it is capable of um, dephosphorylating. High, 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 high level of specificity. <clears throat> now, we're, we're pretty far along in this talk. And um, so I want to just, um, I put this slide here to, because we're going to start talking about now about the tyrosine kinases. And as I was getting ready, I said, one of the things is, I, I have to tell you that this last series of five lectures is completely different than anything I've ever done before. Even though I'd given the same talks, a lot of the same slides, I honestly didn't understand what I was talking about the last several times I did it. And this time, the, the whole picture has come together much more strongly. And, and that's what I've been sharing with you. So one of the things that I've realized just Honestly, just this morning, it finally hit, was that the 
um, serine threonine kinases are already, they're systems that are already assembled. You can make more or less of them, but they're already assembled, okay? They're momentary things that go on. You can make long-term memories with them, but, but you can't make the nervous system with them. They presume that the nervous system already exists, that the cells have divided, that they've proliferated, that they've interacted with one another, that the pathway already exists, okay? But you have to build that. That's what the tyrosine kinase system is about. The tyrosine kinase system has to do with all these things, proliferation, migration, cell-cell interaction, that sort of thing. And so even though they only make up 2% of the bulk of phosphorylation kinases, they are incredibly important for the development of the nervous system. And of course, um, um, much of much greater importance uh, in utero and in childhood. Okay, so that's what I said. You use it with the serine threonine phosphorylation, but you make it, you assemble the system with tyrosine. So let's look at the tyrosine system. The tyrosine system. It's quite different, a whole new bunch of players here. You will remember from the early slide that we talked about, this is the direct messenger system now. You have a direct extracellular ma messenger. So it activates a receptor tyrosine kinase, which is sitting in the plasma membrane. That is active, and that's the, the kinase itself. And it takes a, phosphor, a phosphate group and sticks it on other proteins. So this is, this is occurring at the plasma membrane surface. All right. There are going to be some non-receptor protein kinases, tyrosine kinases as well. So, um, um, all right, this is what we said. There were 518 protein kinases. Nine, 90 of them were tyrosine. 50 of these 90, 58 are receptor. These are integral membrane proteins, receptor protein tyrosine kinases, and 32 of them are non-receptor. They are going to be your intracellular group. They still are active at the membrane because most of them have lipid anchors to bind to internal membranes. The non-receptor, this is the only thing I'm gonna talk about of the non-receptor protein kinases right here. They are everywhere. They're all over the place. And you find them at the plasma membrane in the cytosol at the endoplasmic reticulum at the nucleus. They have, unlike the others, they are intrinsically active and you regulate them by shutting them off. These are the non-receptor protein tyrosine kinases. They're quite different than everything else. Now, let's focus on the receptor protein kinases, which are more typically central nervous system or nervous system. And many of them have particular relevance here. And I've just put this list together. We're gonna come back to efferins. So don't worry about that if they're not. Most of this stuff you're already familiar with, okay? And, and by the way, most of this stuff is going to show up in the pharmacology course. So you're gonna be using these systems a lot. The receptor protein tyrosine kinases have an extracellular domain and then a transmembrane domain, and then the cytoplasmic domain, which is the catalytic subunit. Ligand binding, and this is, this is common for all of the um, receptor kinases, tyrosine kinases, that ligand binding induces a dimerization. You bring two of the subunits together, and that's what makes the active um, protein, like this. So you had to take your signaling molecule, see, see how these are the inactive receptor tyrosine kinases? It's a homologous subunit, they're, they're, they're monomers. You bind the signaling molecule, they autophosphorylate themselves, they cross-link themselves, and now you have the two of them together and the receptor tyrosine kinase is active. That's how the system works. And this is just, to me, this looks like broccoli, a stick of broccoli, a natural stalk of broccoli. And that's just what I see when I see this. It's, that's what broccoli looks like to me. At any rate, here are the, uh, here's a, this is, you know, an epidermal uh, growth factor. It doesn't matter because they're all similar. You bind to it, they dimerize, then they cross-link to themselves. They're, they have a, a part of their own catalytic subunit is their ability to cross-link themselves with phosphates, okay? And then you still have all the other regulatory stuff, G proteins and also tri-phosphate. Everything else is still there, but, but this is the active possible like to see everybody interacting right let's look at some differences here of the tyrosine kinases from the serine and threonine first of all um, 
you have um, very high um, uh, enzyme activity. These have a very high specific activity. In other words, a turnover rate is very high of these tyrosine kinases. So um, the, the tyrosine, so the, um, here you have, uh, uh, what was the point of this? That uh, the, uh, the phosphatases, sorry. The phosphatases have a thousand times the activity of the kinases. So this is, this is going to be a short lived structure to begin with. You don't want this system going all the time. There are um, a hundred, there are over a hundred phosphatases. There were only 90 kinases in the threonine, in the tyrosine system. That's as opposed to, remember back in the serine threonine, there were 428 kinases and 30 phosphatases, right? So this system um, depends much more on specificity and activity of the phosphatase system than the kinase system, okay? So, uh, and they have a very different catalytic domain. This is an interesting thing. So if you think about the tyrosine molecule, it had that big phenyl group and then the hydroxyl group, that makes it a very long molecule, okay? In comparison to serine or threonine, which were very short, stubby things. So the tyrosine kinases, okay, have to, and phosphatases have to be able to reach in. So they, they have a very long crevice and the catalytic domain is at the bottom of that crevice. So the serine and threonine never get to the catalytic site. Only the tyrosine, phosphorylated tyrosine, is long enough to get to the depth of this crevice where the catalytic site is. In terms of the activities of the tyrosine kinase, you, this is gonna be a common theme, okay? So, so look at this, okay? Survival, differentiation, axon guidance, synaptogenesis, synaptic transmission. All of these things are in development, right? All of these things are making new, okay? That's, you don't see the serines and threonines doing that. So when you look at tyrosine, and I, I went back this morning and underlined these because, I, 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 like I said, only this morning did I really realize uh, this, this overwhelming uh, function here. When you look at the tyrosine kinases, it is retinotopic migration, okay? Formation of the neuromuscular junction, not activation of it, formation of the neuromuscular junction. Synapse formation. I had already written these words. I just went back and underlined them. Here's agrin. This is, a, this is the way you assemble, assemble a neuromuscular junction. You're not going to use the agrin for the activity of the neuromuscular junction. You're going to use it to create the neuromuscular junction, survival by nerve growth factors, okay? Innervation of axons coming in, um, including re-innervation phenomena after stroke or brain injuries or anything else. All of this, the regrowth of, of, of nerve terminal, all of these things are going to depend on tyrosine kinases. Look at them. Cell proliferation, cell differentiation, survival. Again, these were things I had previously written, but it, it, it never sunk in. Yep. Besides that, retinotopic On the efferents, we're going to come, we're going to. So, in other words, what we're saying is that the retinotopic mapping, and I cut a lot of this out. Remember, this was a long, this had its own lecture, last two, last series. Um, but I'm going to come back to these efferents. And what you have are gradients of efferent and efferent receptors that are what cause the cells to migrate along gradients. So they send out, we'll, we'll come to it, just say, but, but that's just an example is in the retina. So here you are. So this term, which you may never even have heard of, of efferents and efferent receptors, okay? You may not have heard of them, but this is the largest subfamily of receptor protein tyrosine kinases, okay? So this is a big deal, okay? Uh, they are about development. They are about axon guidance, right? About formation of the nervous system as regulated by tyrosine kinases, and this is the biggest family of them, okay? So let's just spend a minute with them. There are a couple of subfamilies, A and B. Both the efferents and the efferent receptors are active only when membrane bound. So they require cell-cell contact, all right? 
They are the major regulatory system for axonal guidance, formation of tissue boundaries, cell migration, segmentation of pathways. What makes the nervous system the nervous system is accomplished through the efferin, efferin receptor system of receptor protein tyrosine kinase. It's like, oh my God, this is not a small thing, okay? And, and underlying all of it, the cytoskeleton, the maintenance of the system, long-term potentiation, angiogenesis, stem cell differentiation, all being done through the tyrosine kinase system. This I just put in about an hour ago. I, I said, what the heck is an efferent? So, you know, how big or small a molecule? These are not small molecules at all. These are not even, they're, they're almost beyond peptides. You don't even call them a peptide. These are big molecules. The efferent, the ligand, is a large molecule. 20, 40,000 Dalton molecules. These are, these are serious molecules that are going to be on one cell and then they migrate along the receptor gradient, okay? So the cell is making efferin A. It encounters efferin B. It has no interest, it just keeps on going. But it encounters an efferin A receptor and it hangs out here for a while. They talk. Okay, they start influencing one another. It starts looking for more. We'll look at that in a minute. It starts looking for more through this series of receptors, which then, see, so here's, you know, and these are receptor protein tyrosine kinases. So they are enzymes which are embedded. The receptors are um, enzymes with a catalytic subunit for, which is a kinase. Okay, they are embedded in the membrane. So, so they have cell-cell contact. I have an efferin A, I encounter another one. That activates the post-touched cell. I won't even, no synapse yet. Post-touched cell. And it goes, hey, I've been touched by a kindred spirit. Let's make it receptive, make ourselves receptive to this kindred spirit and activates a whole system which now al aligns uh, the two. <clears throat> And, and this is the this is axonal guidance, which is a great topic all by itself. These are, this is a, I love this. This is a picture of the phyllopodia that occur on the outgrowing axon, uh, the which is of course membrane bound. And and these things, I there are beautiful stuff online. Go to YouTube and look at these and watch this thing feeling and feeling. It's amoeba-like motion. It touches the wrong thing. The whole thing retracts. It's gone in a fraction of a second. It's gone. The entire assemblage disappears in a fraction of a second. Okay? Then it starts in another direction and it starts looking for something that it likes. Okay? That's the way the system works. They are through efferins, efferin A and B family and their receptors. Okay? So that's it. That's, uh, that's, my view of the uh, signaling within the nervous system from, from the neurochemical perspective, okay? And what you're gonna do now is for the rest of this year, you'll now be uh, working through the systems that utilize all of these second messengers uh, for the various purposes of motor function, sensory function, a regulation of, of homeostasis and everything else are going to be making use of the structures that we've talked, the macromolecular structures that we began with, and the second messenger system. Okay? So, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. And goodbye, world. <laughs>